All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thanks for joining us today. I hope you and your family are safe and well. My name is Diana Barnes, and I'm the program's lead for the Tom Love Innovation Hub at OU out of Norman. Uh, Donna Miller is the CEO and co-founder of Purse Power, and I'll be partnering, she and I will be partnering to deliver this program um, on a weekly basis. So Purse Power uh, is working to help women use their massive purchasing power to drive positive change. Um, and the Tom Love Innovation Hub is a center for um, innovation and entrepreneurship here in the state of Oklahoma. Um, I'm excited to have Jennifer Edwards on the program today. Jennifer is program manager. Okay, that part was left off. Uh, just as oh. program for the REI Bus Women's Business Center. My apologies on that. Uh, today on our program, Jennifer will be sharing her insights and resources available to female entrepreneurs. Um, we're in a meeting format today and be we'll be taping the program. Videos for our shows are always available on the website at firstpower.com under Let's Share the Journey tab. People have told us over and over how impressed they are with the quality of speakers we have on the show. Please go to pursepower.com to watch prior episodes. The link to register for each Friday show is on the website every Monday morning. Jennifer, you want to talk to us a little bit about your background? Absolutely. Uh, my background, well, I've been now with the Women's Business Center. I just celebrated 13 years. And so I have been here for a while, uh, really focused on developing and cultivating resources for women uh, business owners, women leading in business, entrepreneurs, um, startup through, uh, through selling or retiring out. Um, prior to that, my background is in private charitable funding. And so uh, what I found was a really, really nice segue from one to the other. Uh, because when we looked to fund nonprofits, we looked to build capacity internally so that they were getting maximum use of those funds. And it's really similar concepts to managing and really building and scaling up small businesses. Um, and then prior to that, through college, I uh, worked as a public relations associate for some women focused nonprofits around central Oklahoma. Um, and I went to the University of Oklahoma. Our uh, nonprofit organization management degree program was just beginning. Uh, so I was able to take those courses in my senior year and then actually move on to teach those courses for the next handful of years. So I did that for about six years. Uh, and then our schedule picked up as we grew the Women's Business Center. So I stepped aside from that because they've got really, really wonderful talent that's developed that further. That's absolutely so, but, fantastic. Oklahoma born and raised. <laughs> awesome. Um, so let's talk a little bit about REI Women's Business Center. Um, what do they do? Uh, what's the relationship with the SBA? Um, yeah, let us know a little bit about it. I think we're having some technical difficulties. I'm back. Okay, yes, now you're back. Okay, are we all here? <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I am out actually traveling in the panhandle today. So I am trying to hold my mouth just right and hold the phone just right so that the connection remains. Uh, but I'd love to tell you about REI's Women's Business Center. We are a statewide women's business center partially funded by the U.S. Small Business Administration. Uh, how that works is that you have to have a host organization there in your state um, that supports you with additional resources, with addi additional tools, additional staff. So REI Oklahoma is a statewide economic development nonprofit, and they function as our host organization and have a slew of other programs incredibly beneficial to women in business. Uh, full business lending and business financing division, down payment assistance for home buyers. Um, usually there are new markets tax credit allocations rolling through the state. Um, the new minority business centers, we were just awarded. Um, so there's a lot of complementary services. Um, so the goal is when a woman onboards for assistance to grow or maybe start her business in whatever place she's in, there's there's some good handoffs that can happen for additional support. Um, the goal is to develop that ecosystem further and further within Oklahoma and beyond on that national scale so that women uh, 
don't feel as alone, which is probably the, the biggest piece of feedback we get from women business owners. Once they venture out on their own, they feel kind of alone. And so we do a lot of networking and referral building opportunities to help bridge those gaps and make those connections. Um, and then a lot of one-on-one -on -one business counseling uh, that is always free of charge. And then um, a growing amount of small business workshops and topical trainings and technical assistance, um, such as helping them prep um, documents to move towards maybe securing investors, maybe in securing that next level of funding, maybe learning how to hire more efficiently. Um, so whatever stage they're in. So we get to work really closely with community partners and strategic partners. Um, what that can look like is economic development authorities and colleges and technology centers and library systems and making sure that we're all communicating. There's a novel thought to kind of pool resources and pool connections uh, so that there's hopefully more of a centralized location to come. Um, so we joke that you can call really anybody in the in sort of the resource providing sex, uh, service side of, of small business and get to any of the rest of us. Um, but we're really incredibly fortunate to get with, um, to work with women business owners. Again, all the way pre-thought, you know, we have a lot of women that'll come in and say, hey, I really need to do a feasibility study um, about if this is the right next step or the next venture um, for me all the way up through. Um, I'm working with someone right now who's 35 years in and she has her five-year exit plan set. Uh, and so um, the Women's Business Center with REI Oklahoma is, we just started our 21st year. So we have been uh, serving women across the state for 21 years. Um, but on the national scale, we are part of the Association of Women's Business Centers. And there are now 147 women's business centers across the U.S. and U.S. territories um, to support women in business. They might not look exactly like ours. They may not be structured exactly like ours but they're going to be huge wealth of information and support. Um, all of us are charged with a pretty broad goal uh, when it comes down from the federal side, which is support women in business. And so we get to really define what that looks like in each of our states. Um, because as you know, uh, some of you being here in Oklahoma, the panhandle of Oklahoma versus southeastern Oklahoma, versus Tulsa, Oklahoma City, uh, the types of businesses being started by women, the types of industries of focus are vastly different. And so we're really given the freedom to figure out what works best um, and what the needs are so that we can deploy services in the most effective way possible. That's absolutely amazing. Um, and you answered some of the follow-up questions I had. One question I that came up in my head is, can women outside of Oklahoma um, connect with you and REI and take advantage of some of the services? We actually saw that change quite a lot during the pandemic. Uh, we saw it go from really boots on the ground, local um, grassroots, if you will, uh, engagement to a lot of other uh, states, actually 27 other states and uh, four other countries um, have engaged with us virtually because our trainings and counseling opportunities kind of switched gears to virtual. So we always encourage that. But also we will make sure and get them in contact with their local women's business center um, so that they've got someone there that understands the nuances of their state and their area. Because um, we, we, we're happy to work with them, but we also want to make sure that they've got someone that's a little closer to them um, that, can, that can assist them as well. Yeah, absolutely. Is, it, uh, is there any cost to uh, the services with REI? Very, very rarely is there a cost associated. If you see a cost associated with it, it'll be extremely minimal. Um, and that might be, be just because we've got a specific cost associated with, let's say a specific training. Um, so all of our one-on-one -on -one 
business advising is always done free of charge. Um, any of our networking opportunities, we're going to make sure those things are free of charge. Most of our topical trainings, you're going to see they're free of charge. When you see a fee, it's something that maybe has a specific licensure that comes with it. Um, for instance, when we train on QuickBooks, we dive in deep and those ladies train on our laptops with our QuickBooks licenses so they don't mess up their own books. <laughs> so, uh, so you'll see a little bit of a fee associated with that, um, but we're saying that's our most expensive training and it's $150. Um, and we've compared it uh, even around in our state and region to make sure that we're less than 50% of what that training would be uh, elsewhere. Um, so most of our other trainings, you're going to see a $20 or $40 investment. Um, again, if there's specific costs, we can alleviate that sometimes too when we have sponsors that jump on board for those trainings. That's fantastic. I love that. Um, so you mentioned... Um, like the pandemic and how things kind of changed during that. What are some of the obstacles that you've seen um, female entrepreneurs struggle with, say, when they first get started versus when they're later on and even what you saw pre-pandemic versus post-pandemic? I really love this question because <clears throat> the, the concerns and the challenges starting out pretty much across the board for women business owners is securing financing, securing capital. Um, it's, it's a scary and unknown game sometimes. Um, so understanding what small business lending and small business investing looks like um, is, I would say, seven times out of 10, the bit of feedback we get when they say, Mm, okay, I'm concerned about something. We always know the financing talk is coming next. Uh, so I, I think that that shifts gears once a woman has been in business uh, for several years, had some success with securing financing, securing contracts, uh, and then we see the points of concern uh, really shift to personnel. And that's something that's been amplified if we're talking pre and post pandemic. Uh, that I know we've all experienced it. That, that's, a, that's a challenge that's been amplified um, uh, during the pandemic is, is staffing, um, hiring efficiently, getting trained in kind of a new world, uh, which we've got a lot more remote employees. So what does effective training look like for them? Um, so that really has become uh, more and more of a, a concern than, than I think it's ever been before. Okay. That leads into another question. Um, what are some of the skill sets that you see that the women might be lacking or that they have a need for with their businesses? Really crucial to be able to read a budget. And uh, we just, we see a gap sometimes um, with that because uh, because of whatever the background has been, because of whatever the, the journey, the story that's led them to this point, um, women start businesses because they've got a passion for their mission and a passion for their service or product. Um, reading the budget and managing the budget often comes secondary. Um, and it's perfectly fine to outsource your bookkeeping, but you have to be able to check in and check up on your business and know how to read that budget. And so that um, skill set is one that I can't preach enough and it doesn't have to be as scary and there are great resources to help you learn what all those different financial statements are indicating about the health of your business. You know, the difference between um, when you do a profit and loss statement versus your cash flow analysis, you know, those, those things really do indicate different, um, often different health metrics, but also different stages of your business. So that's a skill set that I often uh, try to try to instill and make sure that we're focused on. Um, and then on the sort of softer side of skill set, um, effective managing and having those crucial conversations um, is something that I think women excel at, but applying that in the business world and what that can take you then into negotiation skills. Uh, I really think one thing leads into the other. So especially when we talk about those next level businesses that aren't startups, they've got several years under their belt, they're focused on efficiencies, they're focused on those vendor agreements or those contracts, um, making sure that 
you are uh, confident and equipped in your negotiating skills um, is, is something that I think is worth some time and attention. That sounds great. Um, going back to funding a little bit, what are some of the easy, are there some ways of getting financing that are easier or are some that, uh, depending upon the circumstance that you would weigh heavier or more positive than another? Can you talk a little bit about financing? Sure, sure. We have that conversation a whole lot um, because if we're talking about startups, the financing available to them is pretty quite is pretty different than those established businesses, and it can be even more of a challenge. And so, when we're talking financing for those startup businesses or those younger businesses, uh, making sure that you're establishing that relationship with your local bank is absolutely vital. But also, reach out to alternative lenders. Um, utilize SBA loan products because often those SBA loan products, which are not, uh, which are not funded directly by the SBA, they, they are required to go through an intermediary, a CDC, a certified development corporation, um, such as, such as us and our business lending team. And there are several others. Um, it, it's a way to guarantee loan funds. So the SBA doesn't lend directly, they provide a guarantee on those loan funds. Frequently, those SBA loans can be used in participation with your local bank. And that's our ideal situation, is we see that you're continuing to build that local bank relationship, but maybe you're leveraging an SBA loan product that alleviates some of the risk to the local bank, so that it makes you um, more palatable to them uh, because they local banks do still consider startup businesses higher risk. They do. And so uh, they can assess your risk is too great. They're not willing to, to roll the dice, um, but maybe there's a part of the loan they'd be interested in doing. So uh, for our business lending team, a vast majority of our referrals come directly from the banks where they say, Hey, we're, we're, open to doing part of this, but not the whole thing. We're not willing to take the risk for the whole entire deal. Um, so a lot of times we can, uh, our loan officers are great at figuring out how to structure uh, those loans so that it helps you work with the local bank and build that while alleviating some of the risk for the bank too. Um, so, so looking to see what SBA products you might qualify for, or be eligible for, I think is a fantastic step. I think it's not utilized enough, uh, quite honestly. And what scares people away is the burden of paperwork. The paperwork is a lot. It's really pretty uh, gruesome to walk through the process sometimes. But once you walk through that process, you have everything set. So it makes those conversations then with a local bank, possibly an investor, a lot easier because you have every possible document you could imagine already prepared. <laughs> so, so taking the time and getting some guidance through that process and utilizing those tools such as SBA loan products, um, I think is a really great way to, um, to leverage then some additional funds. And when we're talking about leveraging funds, it's also, I think, underutilized to, to get a, maybe a revolving line of credit through your bank or something that's a startup fund through another um, type of alternative lender. You know, we see Kiva funds popping up more and more. Um, use those to secure hard assets, you know, secure um, those, those pieces of equipment, those locations, um, those vehicles that you can then use to collateralize and you can leverage that to secure larger funds so that you're building and building um, your access to capital. So I think taking it, um, viewing it in a stair step kind of structure uh, uh, and having that foresight and that long-term outlook uh, is just a tremendously helpful practice when we're talking financing. Great. Um, that has me wondering about bootstrapping because I know that that's kind of a popular mindset here in Oklahoma. What are your thoughts on bootstrapping your business versus financing? Women are typically wonderfully budget conscious and really frugal in how we start businesses. And while that is to be commended, my concern is uh, when women bootstrap and use their own personal savings, down to zero. And then they don't have anything that they can use as a down payment or um, to pledge towards 
uh, that next st that next step of financing. Um, so while I think bootstrapping is fantastic if you're able to do that, I would I would more like to see uh, women being very realistic about the type of money they'll need. Don't spend your savings down to zero. You know, spend it, see where it can get you, but keep that reserve. That, so you've got a down payment towards a loan, or you've got some skin in the game um, as far as uh, liquidity left uh, when it comes to possibly investing and other types of um, financing options. And, and I know that some being here in the Midwest, certainly some women are very opposed to assuming debt. And so really taking it uh, in that stair-step approach that I mentioned earlier, um, and when you can kind of see how you scale up in that um, even self-funding system, um, I think will be more beneficial than depleting savings or other backup accounts and then not having a place to go from there. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. Um, so on the topic of finances, uh, there seems to be a lot of money potentially coming down from the federal government for things like green initiatives. Um, what are some of those opportunities that might be available that someone might be interested in? So there are all sorts of things coming down federally. Uh, we are seeing opportunities right and left. The thing that I want to encourage women the most to do is so that you can most quickly access uh, those funds those contracts, if it happens to be contracting directly with the federal government, you have to be certified as a woman-owned small business. It's going to do you leagues of benefits. So there are state to state, there are some state certifications. Um, those are wonderful and those are helpful, uh, but making sure that you uh, on the federal level are certified as a woman-owned small business. It is literally called the woman-owned small business certification. Uh, so it will, um, it will just open up all sorts of doors for a lot of those opportunities that are coming down. Because a lot of those opportunities that we're seeing are, are structured like um, a contract and subcontract uh, situation. And the only way they know if you're eligible to bid is if you've got your credentials and you're listed in their system and you're seeing those things uh, come out that you can apply for, that you can compete for, um, you have to have that WOSB um a certification and so if you'll if i have some time i'd love to expand on that just a little bit more absolutely because, We've got plenty of time. Um, okay okay good okay good because this is one of my absolute favorite things that we get to to work with women on um the federal government in 2011 so i had been doing this for two years uh passed the legislation to create the woman-owned small business uh, certification program and a woman-owned small business set aside. That means that 5% of all contracts that are awarded by the U.S. government each year have to be set aside to be awarded to a woman-owned business. So for years and years, there have been uh, disadvantaged owned business set-asides for doing business uh, federally minority owned business, veteran owned business, native owned businesses. The entire goal of these is to level the playing field for small business and for small businesses led by, um, I think it's a safe place to say this by not, uh, uh, you know, well off white men, you know, so it, so the goal was to level that playing field. So 2011, we saw the launch of the women-owned small business a certification program, and that set aside of 5%. It's a game changer because it narrows your competition pool. So when it was approved, there were 83 NAICS codes, so your, um, your industry code uh, for North America. Uh, there were 83 NAICS codes approved. Those represented industries in which women were typically underrepresented. We've seen that get blown out of the water. There are hundreds now of NAICS codes approved. So you'd be hard pressed to be in an industry where you didn't qualify to get your woman and small business certification. The certification process does not have a term limit, meaning you don't have to have been in business for a minimum amount of time and you don't have a specific limit on the number of years that you can use the set aside, meaning compete for that 5% of contracts. Not, and I'd like to clarify, you can compete for any contract you want to, 
Uh, but those that you see earmarked for WOSB or women owned small business means that your competition pool is narrowed to other women owned businesses. So some of the other big guys aren't going to be in that pool of competition with you. Um, but we, we have seen just a, a huge array of types of things that the federal government purchases. So I would encourage any woman who thinks, I don't think that contracting is going to be for me. I'd encourage you to go and see what's being purchased because one of my favorite examples of this is we saw, I think it was in 2014 in the report um, of what was purchased federally. We saw millions and millions. Uh, I want to say probably between 10 and $11 million worth spent on walnuts. So you better believe, however, let's say few walnut farmers in the US that were registered that had their credentials that had their certifications were loving that there were millions and millions being spent on walnuts uh, but we see not just products we see services um, and the application for that is much less daunting than what people think um, the application process for that it if you have your documents in order is as simple as a couple of months and that's because uh, of a lot of checks and balances put in place on the federal level so You'll create a login here, they'll verify all the information. So you hurry up and wait for 72 hours. And then the next thing, and you hurry up and wait for a week. And then the next thing. But if you've got all your documents in order, you go through that step-by-step -step process. It's not a hard process, it just takes some time and attention. Um, you can have that in as, as few as a couple of months. Um, so it's not as near as daunting as some of the other set-asides that maybe we hear about uh, people utilizing more that takes you know a year worth of prepping documents and going through interviews and surveys and application questions it is nowhere near that drastic um so i just can't speak enough to what i think are the merits of that uh, we have within oklahoma a lot of women that are starting more and more thankfully that are starting to utilize this and nationally we have more and more women um, getting their credentials and starting to utilize this set aside to really gain some capabilities in contracting and those are useful yes to do business with the government but also to do business with corporations and since i'm here in oklahoma tribes um, it really uh, does open up just a world of possibilities, including marketing. So uh, I will say that every woman needs to assess what they're going to use uh, that certification for and those credentials for. Some say, I want to start learning how to contract. <clears throat> Some say, I don't have one interest at all in doing contracting, but I want to put that seal on my website and on my product and on my email signature line that says I am certified woman owned because as we all know women uh, really really appreciate and value being able to do business with other women and so being able to have that at the forefront of your marketing um, to me is worth its weight in gold so that process um, can be expensive if you go through a third-party certifier of which there are only three approved in the U.S or there's a, there's a self-certification option. That's what we always encourage women to do, is go through that self-certification process. My team does uh, really handhold through that process. There is a fee associated with that because it takes so much, uh, so much man, man hours and so much time. Um, so there's a $200 fee from my team if we really walk through that whole entire process with you. Um, and then it's $100 for your annual renewal but um, we've got a good checklist to get you started, but you can find all of those things and the self-certification process and dive in a little bit more at the SBA's website. And so that is sba.gov backslash WOSB. And so since I'm joining from my phone, I can't drop it into the chat box. Oh, Donna did, good. <laughs> um, but I will, I will say that we've probably, um, we've probably had more feedback in this last year from women using uh, that women-owned small business certification credentials and that sort of stamp, that seal, more for marketing than probably ever before uh, because those borders that we've typically seen for where we do business are, are just completely gone and by the wayside. Um, so we're seeing women um, 
shipping more, doing business across state lines and in other countries much more. Um, so the, the reach, uh, as we've gone certainly more virtual than ever before, the reach is just so much greater. And so they can step forward confidently with that, um, that stamp already on all of their documents and, and marketing. Um, so I just, I, I feel like I, I beat it into people's heads because I just think it's a tremendously valuable tool that we should all be utilizing. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, and as you're talking about that, it's reminding me of when I had my own web development and project management business, and I took advantage of the Oklahoma Bid Assistance Network um, to go in and look for those contracts and things like that. Will you talk just a little bit about what women can expect if they're interested in going down the government contract path? Absolutely. The thing I'd like everyone to know is that you're not in it alone. <laughs> there is, as you mentioned, something great within our state, and it's in most other states as well. Uh, here it's called the Oklahoma Bid Assistance Network. So once you get those credentials, that set aside, uh, let's say you're, you're woman-owned small business certification, uh, we're not just going to say good luck in finding contracting opportunities. We're going to say, okay, great. Our next step is to make sure we get you in the hands of uh, as close to your local area as possible because they're sprinkled all over the state, a representative with OBAN. Those are the people that then can take you through that next stage that that I don't have clearance to do, but they do, which is setting up, um, there's a lot of good websites that are available where you will set up, mm, let's call it a profile. And you will say, this is my business. These are our contracts. Um, uh, no, this is, this, is, this is our business. These are our NAICS codes. These are the types of contracts we are interested in or able to bid on. This is the area in which we are willing to work, maybe geographic area in which we're willing to work. So you'll put a lot of your own parameters and a lot of your own information out there. And these are my certifications. And so when a contracting officer lists on one of these websites, um, uh, a contract that's available and open to bid on, you're gonna see that drop straight into your email. If, if it meets, your set aside, your NAICS code, what you've said you do with your business, it's going to send directly to you. And so um, it's, a, it's a nice way to cut through all the hundreds and hundreds of contracting, uh, of contract opportunities that you would be trying to wade your way through. Um, that's not an efficient time of use of anyone's time. And so setting, they're going to help you set up those profiles on those websites where those uh, contracting opportunities get listed so that it really pairs down and filters out and uh, hopefully to your sweet spot. And if it doesn't, they'll help you go back in and adjust and tweak your profile so that it does get you to your sweet spot. Then if you say, okay, I'm going to bid on this. How do I bid on this? <laughs> Thankfully, they're there and can walk you through that process as well. They can say, this is um, the type of documents you're going to be asked for. Okay, this, do you know how to price for this type of a competitive bid? And so they'll be able to provide a lot of guidance when you get to that step as well. So we rely, we work really closely with and we rely strongly on our OBAN network. And again, those, that same network is available in a I won't say all other states, but most other states as well. Fantastic. Um, so we've got a question from Nan, um, and I want to add in a question to this. What types of contracts are available? And she wants to know, are contracts on business coaching or contracts on preparing for retirement available? Mm. So there, again, if you're a walnut farmer, there's apparently contracts for walnuts. So we see, um, we see pretty much the full gamut that you could imagine. So we see not just products, but we see direct services. We see, um, gosh, there are cleaning, there's construction. There is a lot of professional development, um, instruction, um, coaching, uh, public speaking, um, team development, um, and, uh, you know, team building kind of things, because anything at all that the federal government could uh, utilize in services or products, 
um, is a pretty broad category. So we see just pretty much anything you can imagine. So it goes back to my walnut example. I have absolutely no idea what they were using with all those walnuts. I don't know if there was something with walnut oil. I have no clue. Um, but I will say that we've worked with some small businesses uh, in the state. One's a winery that uh, got a pretty significant contract uh, for one of the military installations for all of their retirement receptions and their awards receptions. Um, so it's something that I'm very thankful uh, that she said, hey, I think I, think I wanna get my, my WSB certification um, because we saw more and more of those opportunities coming available. We do have someone that is doing some training um, within the federal government, some staffing training. Um, and so she's secured a, a significant for her. It's her first contract with the federal government. Um, so she secured that, um, it's been about 18 months ago and that's going really well, um, so much so that they'll be renewing and expanding those types of things. Um, but I will say you can do some digging into each department within the federal government and see what types of things they're purchasing. So you know where to focus your time if you wanna reach directly out to specific departments. So we all know that you know, infrastructure type departments or those that are going to be construction and roads and all of those things. But um, check, check into what each uh, other major department within the government is purchasing and see, see what types of things they've purchased. It's all, it's all um, available to you to see what types of things they purchased in the last year or two, because sometimes it's surprising and sometimes it catches us, us off guard too. Um, I would never have told a walnut farmer to get there credentials it wouldn't have crossed my mind now I'm like every person doing anything let's just go ahead and make sure uh, and so your first step would be to see if your next code is one that's approved within that uh, set aside it would be incredibly rare that it's not um, and so I think I've skipped past Diana your second part to the question so what was it uh, she was wondering I, I feel like you kind of answered it if there because there uh if there was contracts for business coaching or contracts for preparing for retirement available. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and we see, we actually see also uh, for like government employees that are transitioning out, we've been seeing a little bit more professional development and coaching um, that's being contracted out as well. And we frequently see that for military members as they're transitioning out of service. Um, so that's a specific pocket too. We see a lot of um, training um, about how to re-enter civilian life, what that looks like, what business ownership looks like. Um, because a lot of, as we know, our veterans are um, just vastly equipped with all sorts of skills. Um, so making sure that they can capitalize on those and can make sure that they're successful in their next stage. Um, there's a lot of opportunities there as well. Right. Um, what are some easy ways for women to go research that information? Mm. So you're going to find a lot of it on the SBA's website and a lot of links on the SBA's website. So when you go in and you look specifically for WSB or for those um, that OBAN network, and, and I hope it's not confusing, but I'm going to tell you another name that OBAN might be listed under because they're kind of changing their branding in this last year. So it gets a little confusing. Uh, so sometimes you'll see OBAN listed as PTAC and that's Procurement Technical Assistance Center. And again, those are na nationwide. So you're gonna see that as well. Um, so you're gonna see it listed as OBAN or PTAC. Um, and you're going to see a lot of links there. I would start with that so that you don't stumble onto something that's, you know, fraudulent, um, which we do see a lot of. So please be careful and make sure that the links that you're cl clicking on are directly from something like the SBA's website. Um, and then you get there. Uh, I, I will say as my caveat about the, the fraud, we don't see a lot of fraud happening in contracting, but we do see a lot of fraudulent uh, websites popping up more and more now that people are so much more virtual uh, than ever before and so much more active online than ever before. But, um, but please don't pay 
uh, please check with us before you pay for some of these services. So as we're talking through contracting and the great opportunities that come along with it, one of the first things that they say is, oh, what's your, what's your DUNS number? Uh, have you registered in SAM, which is the System for Award Management? Oh, we can help you do that for $400 please do not because those things are free. <laughs> so, so we would always encourage you to reach out. We're happy to answer those questions because we get them all day every day um, or reach out to the SBA district office and ask those questions um, because we've seen a, a, a pretty stark increase in those in the last couple of years. I actually had someone recently that I said, I need you to scan in that letter and send it to me because she got it in the mail within a, within a week of registering her business where they said, okay, uh, it'll, it'll cost you this much through us to get your EIN number, for instance. It does not cost to get an EIN number, um, but she it looked very, very official. It had the state seal at the top of it and everything. And so I said, would you please send it to me because I need to use this as a cautionary tale. Um, so please be mindful as you're clicking on links um, or if you have questions about anything in the process, always reach out. We, we want you to know that um, there are resources available and there's a lot of free resources available. It costs you nothing but some time to call us and ask the question or to shoot us an email. Fantastic. Um, and Nan was wondering, how do you market to let women know about your services? Okay, I might need you to restate that because I got a little feedback on it. Oh, that's okay. Um, what are some ways that women can go and find out about your services? How do you market your services? Specifically with the Women's Business Center? We do not have an advertising budget. It is almost entirely word of mouth, so you can always check our website, uh, which is reiwbc.org, um, and that's where you will find all of our calendar of trainings, um, a link to do um, a, a client intake, which we need for anyone that gets one-on-one -on -one assistance. Uh, it has less to do with the small business owner. It has more to do with us uh, and that we're tracked federally and they make sure that we're helping the women we say we're helping uh, and that we're um, really providing the assistance we should. Um, so there's a good intake process. There's also a way to sign up for our e-news so that you can get, um, it's bi-weekly emails of upcoming events. And so we try to label really clearly which things are virtual versus in-person. And if they're in-person, what community they're in. Um, thankfully, we're getting back to more and more in-person but what we also found within our state and beyond is a lot of our most rule-based businesses saying we absolutely need the, a really strong virtual component to continue. It helps us save on drive time. And in the most recent past, it really helps us save on uh, our budgets because of fuel costs and the time. Uh, if we are working with a woman business owner that is a one or two person operation, us uh, taking that drive time to attend something and then drive back may mean that the business has to be closed for that handful of hours. Um, so you will always see some virtual options as a regular opportunity. Um, and those sessions will range from how to write your business plan for those in that startup phase up through exactly what we've been talking about, the woman-owned small business certification uh, training that kind of introduces the idea to women that are, uh, that are thinking of taking that next step um, and then beyond. You'll see a lot of additional topics that are offered virtually. And then we uh, still try to do some, but we're doing more and more in-person and less virtual of networking opportunities, simply because uh, if we can get women in a room together, the connections and the conversations that happen is wonderfully done in a virtual room, but is even better done in person. Uh, so we have uh, started reintroducing those all across the state. Again, those are always free to attend. We do ask that you pre-register if possible, if not always show up, but we do ask that you pre-register just so we have a, a head count for food and seats. Um, but you can get on that email list and get um, those email updates every couple of weeks. And we get a lot of engagement through our Facebook page, which is under REI Women's Business Center, um, and a lot of questions. And we'll try to share photos um, from some of those uh, trainings and networking events as well, and some really um, viable resources. So you'll see us share a lot of direct um, 
direct links and say, okay, here's the legitimate link for this. Okay, here's where you go to navigate this resource. And really we started doing that more and more and more during the pandemic because we had uh, those federal um, assistance programs rolling out at an insanely uh, high speed, but also being used up at an insanely high speed. So we uh, really got uh, more proactive in sharing those opportunities as soon as they became available because so frequently they were used up so quickly those PPP loan funds, those idle loan funds, um, other types of resources that were available. Um, and so that's continued. So you'll see a lot of resources shared on that Facebook page as well. Fantastic. Um, let me go ahead and open it up. Nan, do you wanna ask Jennifer your question? Unmute here. Uh, Jennifer, I'm looking at the Washington certification because you know I'm tracking you and saying, you know, what is available. And the, uh -huh. the one thing that looks like a limit for me is it looks like there's a personal net worth limit, not work limit, <laughs> worth limit of uh, $1.32 million. And is there that kind of limit at the federal level as well? No, you're going to see um, there are, I've talked a lot about the woman-owned small business certification. There is also an economically disadvantaged woman-owned small business certification. For those of us in Oklahoma, almost everybody's going <laughs> to fit into that. They call it a EDWSB. Um, that's going to be much more restrictive in what your personal net worth can be. Um, so that WSB is going to be much higher. Um, also, your, when you are calculating your personal net worth, uh, please exclude the value of your primary residence. So that will not be included in there. Um, so, so make sure that as you're, as you're calculating their definition of your net worth, um, you're going to see it be a, a, much, a much higher limit than what you're thinking. And I assume that that would mean if you're married jointly, held assets, you know, or assets in a trust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, it will. Uh, it will. It, there will be some retirement accounts that are going to be excluded. Uh, so there's okay. going to be some caveats of things that you can exclude. Um, and then joint, uh, if it's a true co-owned, you know, account or balance, then yes. Um, if it's not, for instance, if your spouse has um, an employer matched retirement account. It's not going to take that into account. Okay. Thanks. I, I was wondering about uh, whether or not you guys help people um, compete for contracts, to understand how to respond, because it seemed very convoluted and complex. It certainly can be complex. And so we work pretty closely with that OBAN network, those PTAC representatives, because um, our, our ability to see some of those documents and some of those things is going to be a little bit limited. But what I will say that we do frequently is help when you're drafting those capability statements. And that that one or two pager is going to be really important um, in, in that process um, because it's going to help communicate clearly what you are doing and what you want to do. So it's a good starting point when you're competing um, to share that with a contracting officer and say, is this really the right fit? Or upload it if it's requested. Um, the neat thing too, if you are, uh, the neat thing about the WSB set aside is that if you are have that credential and you've got all your documents uploaded and there is a contracting officer through the federal government that says, hey, I if you if you're if you're bidding on something um they may say you know what if you'll let me have access to your documents i'll make sure and so that's a nice feature as well um that kind of cuts out some of the guesswork in that in that process of how to compete now if you're talking about how to how to price those bids so that you're competitive and what that process looks like then we're going to rely heavily on those ptac representatives um because they could see a lot more of that than what i could see Great, thank you. Do you have any sure. other, any more questions? Oh, oh yes, Joyce. Um, uh, hey, Joyce. Hi, Jennifer. Um, I did have a question. It was about workforce. 
Um, I have a friend who owns a business in a different uh, state and she's had interviews scheduled and people not show up or she hires people and then they don't stay long for whatever. But uh, she told me her latest hire was someone who was older, maybe even over 60. With the market the way it is, are older workers now being looked at more positively? Since it seems like younger workers are not as focused, or I don't want to say that sounds me, but maybe have a different attitude towards the work environment today. Ah. <sighs> Joyce, I love that, uh, that question because you said a whole lot there and, and you've caught on to something that's absolutely happening is that we're seeing that shift, especially those small businesses that rely heavily on those employees. It's, it's frequently someone that needs to be able to wear a lot of hats and where they find that a lot more and more is going to be with with uh, more mature generations in the workforce. And so we see a lot of efforts coming out from AARP on the national level and the state level in, um, you know, helping kind of bridge those, those employees that, you know, maybe they were retired out of their previous career, but they're absolutely still uh, in the workforce and still active. Um, and there's such good communication coming out. There's also really good communication and work being done by AARP nationally um, for what we call Encore Entrepreneurs. So we're seeing those 50 and over with just years and years of fantastic layer upon layer of experience. Um, we're seeing them start businesses at a higher rate than ever before. And so they call it Encore Entrepreneurship because it's sort of their second act. You know, it's, it's often those businesses that are being started um, once, once people are around what you would assume as a normal um, sort of retirement age. And so we're seeing that shift uh, really gaining speed um, because I think as, as a nation, we can't afford to not be taking full advantage of that knowledge and expertise. And you are exactly right. We are seeing more and more small businesses say, how do I get someone with years of experience that has the work ethic? Um, and it's a great place to be because uh, there's just um, so many benefits of working with those that are in that 50 plus, the experience, the work ethic, um, communication skills are, are quite different than they are now. Uh, so there's just a lot of benefits. So Joyce, you are exactly correct. We've, we've experienced that as far as feedback as well of their favorite type of employee to hire is kind of shifting back towards those that, you know, we can, we can get you trained on technology. Whereas a handful of years ago, they wanted anybody that was young enough to understand new technology. Now that's shifted and they're saying, we'll train you on the technology. If you have good phone etiquette, if you have good <laughs> customer service skills, um, those are the things they're looking for, for even more now. Fantastic. All right, we've got a few more questions and only a few more minutes left. Um, so uh, Nan was wondering, do you have an AARP contact for uh, Encore Entrepreneurs? Did you ask for a contact name? Uh, a contact, an AARP contact for Encore Entrepreneurs. Mm. Um, so I love Michelle Sourjohn is here in Oklahoma. And it is spelled exactly like it sounds, S-O-U-R-J-O-H-N. Um, and her team is at the Oklahoma office. And then I can find and share with you also, we have been working a lot on the national level, but I'm blanking on her name because there is specifically now staff assigned to what they call Encore Entrepreneurship. And so we're seeing more and more uh, training sessions uh, coming about. And actually we're um, partnered up. So we will start, you'll start uh, seeing us deliver those um, in this next year. And so they will literally send us all of this great curriculum that is specifically geared towards those that are 50 plus that are starting new ventures. Um, and so sometimes it addresses some of those gaps, some of those things we were just talking about, technology, uh, documentation, uh, accreditation or credentials, um, and what the need is, but through that lens of specifically for those 50 and over. 
So if you are on their website and you click on the links that say Encore Entrepreneurship, you're going to see a whole staff now assigned to it because it's just gaining in momentum. Right. Um, and what is one thing you would like everybody to walk away with from today? Oh, that you are not in this alone. Uh, I, I never want entrepreneurship to uh, feel uh, lonely. I, I want women to know there are so many great resources available. And no matter what state you're in, there is going to be some sort of um, helpful entity. If there's not, reach out and we'll help you find it. <laughs> uh, because we joke that resource providers in each state are sort of the best kept secret. Um, and, and that shouldn't be the case. I want to shout it from the rooftops that um, you're not alone and women value doing business with each other and building each other up and growing together as a community and building that ecosystem of support. Um, a lot of times we use the term fabric that's because we're so tightly interwoven, that fabric of support. Um, and uh, now that we've been hosting, we call it the OKC Women's Business Breakfast. Uh, Jane is really familiar with it. Jane was one of our uh, pioneering uh, uh, women business owners to be a part of that group. We have now been, we are in, gosh, we're in year 12 of, of having that breakfast and it's a monthly networking opportunity. And there's, it goes so much beyond saying, hey, I need referrals for my business. And it goes to, hey, I'm having problems with my CPA. And so there's a lot of vulnerability and there's a lot of connection that happens on different level and there's trust that's built. And that's what I want every uh, woman in business to know is that um, that can be done and there's places and ways to do it. And so uh, reach out, get out of your box, you know, get out of your comfort zone and reach out because there's just um, more opportunities than you could imagine. What three actions would you ask the audience to take after this Ooh, selfishly, I'd like everyone to reach out <laughs> and jump on our email list um, because if we have you in our database and we have you in our system, it's a little bit easier than when you call in and say, hey, we've got a really specific question that's going to take three minutes. Um, that's nicer, um, but reach out to, to your local resources as well. So reach out to us, reach out to your other local resources um, and you know, put that email address in that box at the top of our uh, website that I'd mentioned earlier where you can sign up for those email address uh, email lists and then also I would encourage every single woman to reach out to one other uh, woman in business that they know whether it's virtual whether it's inviting them to a coffee uh, whether it's setting a meeting um, it doesn't have to be hey let's get together to do this really hardcore business uh, thing but uh, don't do it alone so that's the final action item I'd like to, everyone to know is reach out and schedule one thing with one other woman in business um, so that you can, you never know what's going to come from it, but so you can start that process. Great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. This has been absolutely wonderful and so much information to take away. Um, so I want to say thank, thank you for you. joining us today. Um, and that Purse Power, the OU Innovation Hub and McLaren Cares are partnering to implement a new program designed to help underrepresented people to have technology careers. If you can absorb a class of 20 to 25 technology students, please contact us. Um, if you're interested in supporting this program, please go to the Let's Share the Journey page on our website and buy us a cup of coffee. Um, that's buymeacoffee.com backslash Purse Power. And then please like and share our social media pages and tell your friends to join us. And then thank you again for your attendance today. And remember, Purse Power, we have it. Let's use it. And we'll see you next Friday at 10 o'clock Central.